the world of epithelium. Welcome back. Step right into the world of epithelial tissues. Like skilled sentinels, the epithelial tissues form cellular barriers that shield our organs, absorb nutrients, and act as gatekeepers between our internal and external environments. From the simple squamous cells facilitating efficient gas exchange in our lungs to the complex columnar cells that line our digestive tract, each epithelial cell type has a unique structure and function that contribute to our overall well-being. And in this session, we will learn all about these amazing cells. Epithelial tissue is one of three primary tissues in the animal body, the other three being connective tissue, muscle tissue and nervous tissue. A single layer of epithelial cells is also called simple epithelium. Based on the shape of the cells, they can be classified as simple squamous epithelium, simple cuboidal epithelium and simple columnar epithelium. A multi-layer of cells is called a stratified epithelium and again, based on the cell shape, it can be classified as stratified squamous epithelium, which is the most common type, stratified cuboidal epithelium and stratified columnar epithelium. The second and third types are rarely ever seen in the body. In some areas of the body, we see a special transition between the simple and stratified epithelia, and hence the name transitional epithelium. However, sometimes simple epithelium gives a false appearance of being multilayered, and therefore gets the name pseudo stratified epithelium. Pseudo meaning false. Pop quiz. Before we discuss the features of the different types of epithelia, let us talk about the one thing common to all of them, which is the basement membrane they rest on. The thin layer of extracellular matrix holds the epithelial cells down, attaching them to the connective tissue beneath it. It offers support, helps transmit signals towards and away from the epithelial cells, and also acts as a mechanical barrier. Let us now study the three types of single layered or simple epithelia. Simple squamous epithelium is like a row of sleeping babies in a neonatal ward, about the same size, wrapped in similar looking cloth, laying flat on their backs. The epithelium too is a single layer of flat, polygonal cells that rest on a basement membrane. In the sectional view, the cells appear spindle shaped with scanty cytoplasm, a bulge at the center produced by the nucleus within, and tapering ends. The nucleus is elongated and stains dark purple or blue. Let's pause to answer a question before we proceed. What is the function of this epithelium? 1. Physical protection. 2. Transfer of substances. Did you pick option 2? If you did, then you're right. Funnily, this can again be compared to those newborn babies we just talked about. They are incapable of offering any physical support, but only participate in the transfer of milk in and out of their systems. Yes, this epithelium is too thin to offer physical support, but helps transfer substances through it by diffusion or filtration. The cells are sealed tightly together at their cell membranes. Therefore, all movements of substances take place through the cells and not between them. If gaps are present between the cells, it can result in substances escaping between them and is called leaky epithelium. The simple squamous epithelium is also called exchange epithelium because of its function and pavement epithelium because it resembles the flat tiles of a pavement. So where in the body do we find this type of epithelium? Of course, 
It has to be in areas where rapid and passive diffusion or filtration of small molecules is required, right? In most of them, this epithelium also gets a special name. The endothelium is the simple squamous lining of the blood and lymphatic vessels. The endocardium is the inner lining of the heart. The mesothelium is the inner lining of the coverings of closed body cavities, like the pericardium of the heart, the pleura of the lungs, and the peritoneum. Moving on, let's talk about the simple cuboidal epithelium. Think of this epithelium as a row of square boxes with a rounded ball inside each of them. As the name suggests, the cells of this epithelium are more cuboidal, where their height and width are almost the same. Cytoplasm is not as scanty as in squamous epithelium, and the nucleus is more rounded and centrally placed. The simple cuboidal epithelium is mostly involved in actively moving substances across membranes and hence forms the secretory portions of glands. They can be very widely distributed in all systems of the body, like the lining of the bronchioles, the ducts of glands, the germinal epithelium of the ovaries, the convoluted tubules of the kidneys, lining the seminiferous tubules of the testes, and also lining of the lens and retina of the eyes. Now we just learned that cuboidal epithelium is widely distributed in the body. However, while they may look similar in all these areas, functionally they are very different. For example, cuboidal epithelium on glands is only for secretion of mucus or serous fluid. But when they line the tubules of the kidneys, their function is active transport and absorption. Cuboidal epithelium that lines the ovaries and testes is called germinal epithelium. In males, it is involved in the production of gametes by undergoing mitosis. Here it is important to note that in females, the germinal epithelium does not participate in the production of the ovum. Next up, we have the simple columnar epithelium. These cells can be compared to a single row of tall rectangular boxes with an oblong balloon inside them. The balloon rests at the bottom of the box. Similarly, this epithelium is made of a single layer of tall columnar cells with an elongated nucleus that lies close to its base. The classic examples of where this can be found are the lining of the entire digestive system as well as the uterus. The upper border of the columnar cells faces the lumen of the tract and can be ciliated or non-ciliated depending on the function. The ciliated columnar epithelium is like a sweeper with a broom, sweeping dust in a particular direction. The columnar cells have cilia or hair-like projections on their upper surface which help in moving substances along. For example, moving mucus along the respiratory tract, ova through the fallopian tubes and CSF along the ventricles of the brain and central canal of the spinal cord. Mucociliary clearance is the mechanism where mucus is cleared from the respiratory tract by cilia that lines the surface of the columnar cells. Remember, mucus that needs to be cleared has to eventually be sent towards the pharynx or larynx where it can then be cuffed out. Therefore, the wave-like motion of the cilia can either beat upwards to move secretion from the lungs and lower airways or beat downwards to move secretions from the posterior part of the nasal cavity. From both areas, mucus or dust is collected at the pharynx or larynx and then expelled. Other than cilia, columnar cells may also have microvilli on their surface, which can be compared to a toothbrush. When it is new, the bristles of the toothbrush are neatly and uniformly arranged and this is called a striated border of the columnar epithelium. If arranged haphazardly, like the bristles of an overused toothbrush, it is called the brush border of the columnar epithelium. Another special structure seen on the surface of the columnar cells 
is stereocilia, which are involved in sensory function as seen in the inner ear. In other areas like the nose and ears, the columnar cells have specialized functions of sensory reception. Some columnar cells may undergo modification in their physical shape and take on a special role in mucus secretion. These are called goblet cells, which we will discuss as the session progresses. Now let us pause and answer this question. Which of these three cells is the most active? 1. Squamous cells 2. Cuboidal cells 3. Columnar cells the right answer is number 3, the columnar cells. Let's justify this. The level of activity of the cell depends on the number of mitochondria and other cell organelles within it. To house these functional components, the cell should be large enough. As columnar cells are the largest of the three types, it can be said that it's also the most active. Pop quiz Now that we've learned about the simple epithelium, which is the single layered lining, let us move on to study multi layered epithelium in the body. The most common type is the stratified squamous epithelium. Think of it this way if you had to arrange all the boxes in the godown of a courier company, how would you do it? You'd arrange all the tall boxes first, then stack up the smaller square boxes above them. And finally, top it off with the flat packages, right? This is how a stratified epithelium would look under a microscope. In most cases, the lowest layer of cells that rest on the basement membrane is the columnar cells. As you move towards the surface, you will see that the height of the cells gradually reduces, and therefore, you could say that the few layers in between have cuboidal cells. And the topmost layer is flattened squamous cells. All cells in the various layers are firmly attached to provide support and structure and are therefore found in areas that are subjected to repeated mechanical stresses like the mouth, vagina, esophagus and skin. Coming back to the analogy, once we stack up the boxes and packages, we cover it up with a waterproof sheet to keep them dry. Similarly, there may be a layer of a protein called keratin that lines the upper surface of the squamous cells to keep it dry and impermeable. This is called keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Skin is the most classic example of this type. Pause and think about this. Cutting and filing off nails or scraping off dead skin from the soles and palms does not cause pain. Why is that? It's because in these areas, the most superficial layers of squamous cells die and lose their nucleus. Instead, their cytoplasm has keratin, which is a non-living substance. When these dead cells are scraped off, the cells closer to the basement membrane are continuously undergoing mitosis to produce new cells. When keratin is absent, it is called a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, where the most superficial cells are living and a thin, flat nucleus is present in its center. This epithelium is seen in areas that are subjected to friction and yet need to remain moist, like the inner lining of the mouth, esophagus and vagina. Pop quiz Now let's move on to the next type of epithelium. Sometimes when we view a tissue under the microscope, we may find that the cells appear to be multi-layered, but in reality only a single layer of columnar cells. This false appearance gives its name pseudostratified columnar epithelium. 
Using the same analogy again, this can be compared to the work of a lazy stacker, one who does not take the trouble to arrange the boxes uniformly. Even though there is only one layer of boxes, they are just thrown together, some vertical, some horizontal, and some even kept upside down. The cells of this epithelium are also arranged in a single layer on a basement membrane, but not uniformly. This makes their nuclei appear to be at different levels when viewed under the microscope, giving them a multi-layered appearance. The epithelium may be found in the auditory tubes, male urethra, and ductus deferens. In the respiratory system, this type of epithelium is always ciliated. There's another special epithelium called the transitional epithelium that is multi-layered like the stratified squamous epithelium but differs from it because the uppermost layer is made of umbrella-shaped cells and not squamous cells. The cells on the basement membrane are columnar but the cells in between are pear-shaped or polyhedral. This epithelium is mostly found in the excretory system that is the ureter urinary bladder, urethra and some parts of the kidney, which is why it gets the name urothelium. Are epithelial cells connected? Yes, they are. And this is of great significance. Not just are they connected, but their bond is very rigid because of the presence of desmosomes which are cell-to-cell -cell adhesions that are seen in all areas subjected to high mechanical stress like the epithelia. This is to ensure that the transfer of substances happens through the cell and not between adjacent cells. Where do epithelial cells get their nutrition from? We know that nutrition to the cells is provided by the blood vessels which are absent in epithelia. Therefore, they receive their nutrition by direct diffusion into the cells. This is also why damage and injury of epithelia can heal and repair quickly. Embryologically, epithelia are derived from all three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. Pop quiz Let's see how epithelium is clinically significant. Carcinoma is the term used to describe a malignant tumour of an epithelial cell. This can be of two types. Squamous cell carcinoma when the squamous cell is involved and adenoma when a gland is involved. With that, we come to the end of this session. We hope you had fun learning with us.